I think it's a lesson for everybody is take away predictability because predictability is the bane of motor racing in the 21st century. Threw in races at the back end of the year. Spa in October. It ain't going to be balmy and sunny, is it? You never know. That's the point. You just do not know. You could have an Indian summer in Belgium. Imagine India and Belgium in this. I'm getting lost. It could be lovely. And likewise, Paul Ricard in November. Apart from that Mistral blown a dog off a chain, it'll be glorious. Bring it on, is what I can say. But right now, we have to focus on this weekend. Three races. You know, this year with the compacted format, we had three races in the opening round at Misano. It really means the drivers cannot afford any mistakes because if you make a big enough miss to damage your car, it can have ramifications. You may not even do all three races, which would be disastrous for your championship challenge. We have seen that three races at Misano, three races here in Barcelona. What I like about a three race weekend is let's get rid of some of the practicing and the, you know, the stuff that doesn't actually make any difference to the outcome of a race. Let's have racing. Let's go racing. Now, a car that really looks so like it's going to go race one, the Lexus, it took two of those three pole positions, but it's had a really up and down season since then. Uh, running in the Silver Cup class with Thomas Neubauer and Aurelian Panis, took the Silver Cup win last time out at Zandvoort. But the pace, we've seen the car, John, we've it's just gone top. That doesn't mean anything particular. That's uh, the first car to set a sensible flying lap in a coolish practice session, pre-qualifying this is, building up towards qualifying later today. But the car has looked good all season, but yet to really, really deliver in the pace that it's had at the various points. I think the core ingredients are in that Lexus. It is a very, very good car, good chassis, well balanced, got a horse of an engine. And once the team get their head around it, it's taking a year to work the way through. It's in the Silver Cup category anyway. So technically, it's not a car that we would anticipate challenging for outright victory. But who's to say, actually, this pairing, could they could take victory in any one of the events this weekend, one of the three events. Now, Dries Van Tour knows he's got an awful lot on his plate this weekend, sharing with Charles Vietz, they lead the championship, but I'll just go back, 52 and a half points up, to, up for grabs this weekend. Their tally at the moment is just over, just only just larger than that, 60 and a half. So, you know, slip up, don't score in one race, and any of your rivals behind could really, really move in, move past. So Dries Van Tour knows he's got to deliver. Well, Bruce, just think back two weeks ago, to the race, the second of the two races in Zandvoort, when the driver change was being carried out, before the car came off the jacks, the rear wheels were spinning. And that was a penalty, a 10 second, sorry, a 30 second penalty. It was going to be a drive through, but because it was within three laps of the finish, the team opted to take the second penalty instead. A simple little error. You could have a draggy clutch that could cause the wheels to spin. You may not have made an error yourself, just something that was beyond your control. All of a sudden, but the whole dynamic of that race was changed literally in the blink of a, a clutch pedal. No, entirely. And I mean, it was a, a swing of doing the maths here, 13 and a half points. Had they had those extra points, they would be sitting really low. And the team that missed out, Mauro Engel and Lucas Stoltz here this weekend, despite having missed the last round, they're only six and a half points down. It's let them back in the gate. Who was missing from Zandvoort because he was on duty in the Nürburgring and rained off for 24 hours. Uh, Mount Ma Raffaele Marcello stunningly quick this morning wasn't particularly impressive yesterday but stunningly quick this morning a 144.9 1.3 seconds faster than albert costa who had just gone quickest of all the, on the well literally on the same lap the mercedes was a few seconds behind so we're seeing times rapidly changing but more importantly picking up space here's a car here's a driver and here's a brand that I would expect to see at the top as well. Yeah, Kelvin van der Linde sharing with Ria Chira to meet her. They've really been a good pairing, but a bit up and down the season. They've taken a win, but they've also had some less great results. But uh, last time out at Zambor, van der Linde very bold in that second race, diving into the lead, but unfortunately straight into the gravel um, as he challenged the Lamborghinis. But I think what we're seeing in this session, John, first flying lap, so-so, and then a huge improvement for the second. We saw this in the previous session this morning for the Formula Renaults. It takes a while to get the heat into the rubber. Of course, the teams are praising all of that situation. That's uh, Belgian Audi Club Team WRT. Now, the Lamborghinis, early in the season, they're a bit up and down, but uh, of all, they, they filled the front row. So Emil Fry racing, they're really getting to grips with these hurricanes. But Caster has been outstanding in terms of certainly in qualifying. That one lap speed that you need to get to find yourself on the front or second row. Albert Costa, if we think back to Nürburgring at the start of that race then, 
likewise the start of the race in Zandvoort. That was an endurance race at Nürburgring, a sprint race at Zandvoort. Very, very combative young man is Al Costa to his American friends, but Al Bert to his Spanish friends. Yeah, well, it's, it's good to be transatlantic, John, but he's in, in, on home ground this weekend, so uh, obviously extra pressure on him to attack and perform. But uh, they're coming on strong, seventh in the championship, but three races here this weekend, plenty of chance to atone. It's all about just doing a good, steady job at the moment, building up and knowing what you're going to do when it's warmer, hopefully this afternoon, hopefully dry, qualifying. Ho hopefully dry, we'll wait and see. In the meantime, Reece Van Thor just pops up into second place in the ID. But he's still 1.2 seconds away from that absolutely blinding lap by Raffaele Marcello and the 88 Mercedes-Benz. Do you reckon they said, Raffaele, give it a couple of laps, get the heat and the tyres, and he missed the thing about D give it a couple of laps, because that was super quick. Mad Panda Motorsport, they're in the, in the mix, big time. And Ezekiel Perez Compact really enjoying his move over to Mercedes, but in 19th place out of the 21 runners. I would think, looking at the time that the 88 Mercedes recorded, he had to be on a new set of rubber, or certainly a very fresh set of rubber that uh, has enabled him to just literally be 1.2 seconds quicker. Chris Frogger, Frogger having a great, great season. Sky Tempesta racing in the Pro-Am class. Really enjoying his pairing with Eddie Cheever. And they the had a sister car out in events, Jonathan Huey and Giancarlo Fisichello, but uh, just enjoying good, good form. Chris Frogger, you see his side, this isn't a representative time, this is him just building up, uh, and in fact, get, getting that lap out of the way because he's building up to better ones, a little bit loose, you can see it was a it was a, a lap in which he wasn't really trying to push too hard, running a bit loose, but Raffaele Marcello, way clear of Dries Fanto, Albert Costa, we've seen him, Mattia Drudy, a driver that John and I really think is an individual indeed, he's been uh, picking out the pace through the course of this season, they're really, really good. Attacker, car 108, that's the Bentley that came second in Zandvoort a few weeks ago. Hugo Chevalier and Pierre-Alexandre Jean, a pair of French teenagers. And uh, it was always the green Bentley we were looking for early in the season, but they have really, really started to find form for CMR. Good to see it. Yes, and I think quite often we see Bentley not particularly far up qualifying and pre-qualifying. Uh, they kind of the tyres get the heat in, but certainly that time from Raffaele Marcello. You see his uh, teammate Timo Bogoslavski listed at the top of the screen. Obviously, he's just taken over the car, but very quick. But car that's really going well, John. AF Corsa, Andrea Bertolini. He knows Ferraris forwards, backwards, sideways, and uh, has really formed a very good pairing in the uh, Pro Am with Louis Machiels. But they're not at the top of their class. They're still chasing some way back from Sky Tempesta. But you know, wins could come their way this weekend. So they're coming, they're in ninth place currently. So nothing in the first sector, improvement in the second sector. So it remains ninth and a 147.305. 147.291 actually is their best lap. That was the previous lap. Still the 88 Mercedes. That's really amazing time set by uh, Raffaele Marcello. And I, I imagine you don't find that amount of time over your opposition just by skill alone there had to be another factor that factor has got to be rubber and there's got to be grip and he used the tires to their best effect on his first flying lap and uh, that time is still standing by over a second to the next competitor albert costa in the i mean fly racing lamborghini and then dries van thor in third place Matteo drudy fourth kelvin Mandel in the fifth and then the second of the two lamborghinis in ricardo feller in sixth position yeah, Ricardo Feller in this weekend for Norbert Seidler. Uh, wow, somebody's off of the, the big two. I saw two big, big tyre but skid marks. Was that me seeing something or was there a car off in turn 12? That is. I thought I saw something. Maro Engel. Yeah, I had him to win. I had him to win. Uh, Look, there's, there's I think it's tar. Steve. No, it's Sancelot Racing. It's Stephen well, Palette who's off oh, okay. at, at the... Um, yeah, well, it's an unusual place to be so well, deep into the gravel. This is the car that's been absolutely flying in the Silver Cup class, leading Bruce, the class. Just at the entry, to, there's, there are two black tyre marks going straight around. Watch and see. Here we go. Into, this is into the entry into turn 10. The kink then for 11. Goes through that. Then all of a sudden, straight on. But what did this do? It didn't. The car appeared not to want to turn. I mean, that is unbelievable. But there were, he literally got on the brakes. He locked the brakes. Then you can see the, the, in the gravel, he had still the front wheels locked. 
nothing's going to slow the car down. The distance from the point where it all went wrong. There you can see that. Look, see those two tire marks? Straight as a straight as a bow. Well, down in 50, the place was actually just picking up his pace, like a lot of these drivers, just building into the session, but it's now time lost. Yeah, red flag. So that car will have to be returned to the paddock. And also, I hope there's no damage to the Tech Pro barriers. I don't think he hit them particularly hard, so they shouldn't have been uh, compromised in any way. As you look at the 25, Santa Lock racing Arthur Rouge and Christopher Hasser. Again, a car that always, always slides under the radar. Well, that was the car that was uh, tipped into a spin at the start of the second race, and yet worked by the way by the Bentley right the way back up the order. A really, really strong run. Again, we're going to be looking at top speeds at various points at uh, to the end of the straight. And uh, Ricardo Feller, new to new to this uh, Sprint Cup for 2020, and goes top ahead of the driver. We're looking at now Christopher Haas, 270 kph, and Timo Bogoslawski listed as third. But I think that time was pro that speed was probably set when Raffaele was in the car. And I think the program there is to give T Timo as much time as they can in the car. Rafa's gone out and said, yeah, it's quick. In that annoying fashion, got out having a coffee. Well, that, that, but Bruce, that, that, this is so typical of Barcelona. The track is very weather conditional. So you go out at the beginning of a session and you go on a fresh set of rubber. You nail your first flying lap. And that's probably the lap that's going to take the remaining part of the day to get back to. So we see the... The Santa Lock Audi being pulled back. The 26 car, Stephen Pellet, Simon, Stephen Pellet, Simon Gashe. Strange. It, watch. I can, I'm trying to figure out. At this point, he lifts off, puts his foot in the brake, and nothing. He's, and he's just locked. And the car just doesn't want to turn. Yeah, he was turning the wheel, but uh, the front wasn't biting no. at all. Well, oh, there's, there's the snatch. The snatch cable has actually detached itself from the back. Self, I think it was a self detachment that. As we go back into the garage, the Elmia Frey garage, Albert Costa. So Albert Costa has been running well in the session, but just to really reiterate, John, the form of the Lamborghinis picking up big time. Uh, they were second and, sorry, third and fourth in yesterday's practice times. But already the best time from Raffaele Marcello is one and a half, nearly one and a half seconds to the best of yesterday. Yep. Nelson Panciatici uh, shares the metallic green CMR Bentley with Jules Gugnon. Flashes of speed, but as yet this season, you know, their best result, third place in the opening race. But they've... I look at my results charts, two non-finishes really does hurt their championship well, push. Well, There's Jules Gugnot. Yes. And normally he's smiling, but, but he's hiding the smile behind the mask, of course, today. We've, we've got ten actual individual rounds, but it's over five weekends, so we've had Zano where we had three sprint races in one weekend. We've got three sprint races here to finish the sprint championship. So everybody getting ready, so the track has gone green. And uh, maybe some are getting slightly caught out. They didn't anticipate the track being ready for action just quite so quickly so the 26 audi has been re returned to the circuit and there's a driving in back now so we'll have a little coming up well hard to see through mad panda can you imagine trying to look through mad panda no but i think i think actually what was happening that axel jeffries had sort of finished his stint earlier than planned so ezekiel Perez compact we saw him running in from the back of the garage there was probably not planning to be in the car for another 10 minutes but now the car was automatic brought back to the pits during yep. that that stoppage so time to change around one hour and two minutes to play still plenty so i just want to reiterate john yesterday the best time set by oscar tunjo in the top sport mercedes oh, now we seeing any damage on that I've front? just just uh, maybe the left front of anything certainly the the, the, the the initial impact would have been on the nose but on the left side more than the right hand side it doesn't look particularly bad but it'll need to be looked at with a splitter you can see is damaged so they will have to take that part of the body work away they've got the spare parts system uh, available it's whether there's any damage behind what we can't see in other words again watch so through turn 10 then accelerating listen turn 11 the lights just go out it's like he lost all power and just i mean there's power steering in these cars also which well if that goes down it's physically very difficult i don't know what it is that's a really hard call. He was there in second gear. In fact, the only damage really seems to be a bit higher up the nose. You can see it just on the edge of the grill, just on the front of the bonnet as well, further up. But uh, the Tech Pro swung back. It, it did is. what it needed to do. It wasn't a high-speed impact at all. Tiny little 
little fracture at the bottom. So the splitter will have to come off with well, that whole lower section, frankly, because the splitter is part of that. So yeah. the track time continues. Team of Bogoslavski is at the top of the charts for the Aka 88 Aka ASP Mercedes, but of course that time set by Raffaele Marcello. Only a handful of cars venturing straight out onto the circuit at the moment. It's a tempo racing at the bottom of the charts. This driver, Fred Vervish, expect that one to pick up a lot of the teams. Hadn't really got to delivering a proper sensible flying lap before that stoppage, but uh, Fred Vervish doesn't need much dialing in at all. The Belgian has been racing Audi R8 since almost before they were invented, I think. Well, I remember back to Manu Kour and particularly the nighttime battle that took place in the first of the two sprint races. I mean, up, there's a, a swarm of Audis and Fred Vervish was amongst them was absolutely manic. I mean, it was almost impossible to commentate on because there was just so much movement and action going on, especially in the inns, inner part of Manicur, uh, out of Adelaide Herpen down to Nürburgring chicane, round the Herpen all the way back up to Chateau Do. Oh, so, it just made brilliant watching. Oh, that was, it, was, <laughs> it was breathtaking, absolutely fantastic. So Fred Babiche well, effectively on a first flying lap in the 66 attempt to racing Audi as you pointed out Bruce there's not an awful lot he needs to learn about an Audi running very wide coming out of that long long turn three track limits I didn't bring it up yet but track limits will always be under observation and anybody who transgresses will have that time deleted so we're so far everybody seems to be reasonably well behaved early days well, what we saw right at the start of the session with purple times on the screen for the Tech One Lexus, we're seeing them again. It's down in 11th place, but Aurelion Panis is starting to wind it up. He's fastest of everybody in the first of the three timing sectors. Time to beat, 1 minute 44.964 seconds. Waiting to see how Fred Bavici did improve his time, but he's still at the bottom of the charts. He's picking it up again this time, but with large margins. When your middle sector, you gained one and a quarter seconds, you know your early laps have not exactly been representative. Well, this is really, I suppose, his first flying lap uh, since the track went green after that momentary stop to retain or to re remove the 26 Santa Lockardi. So Bavici into this last sector. The, you, the, 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 it's a lovely racetrack, but the rhythm has certainly been changed and altered since the introduction of the chicane Ryan's turns 14 and 15 put in for safety reasons and there's no discussion about that so Fred Rubich goes ninth quickest maybe he might go so oh, what's happening are you pulling off on the main pit straight okay, there's so a that, surprise. that is a strange one so something went clearly something clearly happened after they passed it in they weren't planning to come in and uh, that's Matai Drudy who was up at the sharp end sick fastest in the field and that is unusual. I mean, normally, if you know you've got a problem, you're going to come into the pits before you get to turn 16. So that was on the exit of 16 to go onto another lap. And suddenly the car just pulled off the racetrack and they got enough space to get it reversed back into the pit lane. They do. It's typical that long camera shot, the telephoto lens foreshortens the distances. There is back to the Bentley, the 107. Nelson Pantacici behind the wheel. Was down in 17th place. That's why uh, Jules Gugnon wasn't exactly smiling in the pit lane. He waved to the camera, but uh, I was going to say at the time, if he's in the top six, he'll be more effusive. But uh, let's see, the pace starting to pick up a bit for his fellow French racer Nelson Ponciatici. But at the moment, their best time is uh, just two seconds, two and a bit seconds, 2.1 seconds down on the ultimate pace. They're claiming some of that time back, but again, it's a slow burner for Bentley at the moment. Their cars in 17th, that's the green one, and 20th out of 21 for the blue. So we see the 66 RD back at the head of the pit lane, but not back in the attempt to race in garage. They'll want to get the car back as soon as possible. Very strange, as I mentioned, ordinarily, you sense you've got a problem, you'll dive into the pit lane, but the problem arose from this point, so suddenly you had to pull across to the right-hand side of the racetrack and uh, managed to get to the pit lane exit and stopped there so the car was being pushed back by the marshals into the pit lane and hopefully a tempter will get their hands on it as soon as possible well let's see so that's the 55 car back into the pit lane and then the 107 bentley suddenly gone from 17th up to third position i thought they could get in the top six that was very impressive indeed but you know who's flying dries van tour eighth at the moment but he's uh putting in a really really quick lap in the number 32 audi Jimmy Plough and the 89 
Mercedes, they are, where is 89 and this timing and scoring? Uh, 10th, tenth, tenth halfway down the field. And they're the only fourth of the Silver Cup cars. Normally, Jimmy Pla would be bursting out of the top one or two. So this lap, again, not indicating any likely improvements. So just in a sense, going through motions, maybe now, as he goes on to another lap, let's see what Jimmy Pla can do for the 89 Aka ASP Mercedes. Good exit out of turn 16. You're allowed to run over that green, almost like AstroTurf and the exit to paint, but not put all four wheels over the white line, demarcation line. So down into turn one, big break from 270 kilometers per hour. Yeah, the body language, the car down through turn 16 was far more aggressive than before. I said Dries Van Tor was making a bit of a move up into second place now. He's just a quarter of a second uh, on the 88 to Aka ASP Mercedes. So big improvement from 32. Team WRT Audi. Excuse me. The Richard Mahasa comes through turn nine. So first sector, two tenths down. Car currently in third place. So Audi have dragged themselves into the top six. They've got currently in fact, the Owega brothers have now rounded out the top six with sixth position. So a good job, Silver Cup car again. Yes, in fact, that lap for Joseph Owega, which is the younger of the two Owega brothers, uh, puts it just ahead of the, the next Silver Cup challenger into second in the Silver Cup class with Aurelien Panis. I said the tech speed, the, the, sorry, the tech one uh, racing Lexus is picking up the pace. So that's up into seventh place overall. Christopher Haas winding up and the, the new face at Emil Fry Racing Emil, uh, uh, Ricardo Feller, fourth fastest, and he just put in the fastest first set of anyone. So the pace is really starting to move. But what they're doing is only still catching up with that 88 Aka ASP Mercedes, Raffaele Marcello in the garage, Timo Bogoslajski out on the circuit, but that car still at the top of the timesheet. But it's good to see, well, you said, John, yesterday that in the, in the practice session, the best placed Audi was seventh. Absolutely. And now it really, really has changed around. There's the Awaker Brothers car. Still learning as they go through this season, tracks are new to them, but they really are being much more consistent. They're learning their form. The, the speed has been growing, but it's the consistency they've been finding, which yes. is vital. And, and I think the time that they've recorded, currently six figures, is a very good indictment of what they're doing. Uh, they're putting on another set of Pirelli rubber. I wonder, have a number of the Audis, and um, well, the Bentley likewise, which is up to fourth place, uh, sorry, being up to fifth place, have they all followed the, the AAC ASP Mercedes of Raffaele Marcello did, which I would imagine was a brand new set of tyres. You just do not find those lumps of times, as we're seeing from the top six, magic. It isn't magic. It's either phenomenal bit of driving. Well, everybody's more or less at the same level. It's got to be from those little round black things. You might call them donuts. You might call them tyres. But it's tell you what, they are the thing of anything in a race car that will make a difference to a lap time to set of tyres. So the Lexus comes into the pit lane, seventh fastest series of good laps from Ophelia Panis there. His best time, one minute 46.0, so he's a 1.1 seconds down on the time, but still tops the charts. One minute 44.964 seconds for the 88 Aka ASP Mercedes. Quite a few cars have actually already had their second pit visit. We had that uh, brief flurry when they came in during the stoppage while Stephen Pellet's Audi was recovered. That's still in the pit lane, though, down in 18th position. Ricardo Feller, purple first sector, Bruce, up through turn nine, rides the curb on the inside, lets it run what a good... I mean, if he can control the remainder of the slap, he's in the middle of sector two right now, personal best. So all the good work that was done in sector one slightly reduced. Now he's got this final, more the technical area, the more mechanical side of the Barcelona circuit to Catalonia. So into turn 13, easy to overdrive it, keep it neat and tidy, then on the brakes. They then the, use the curb, over the curb, then this exit into turn 16, you can see running the sausage curb on the exit of 15, and then through 16, just on the limit of what's acceptable. Is there an improvement for the 14 uh, uh, Lamborghini? 
No, no, stays the same. He's on done 45.5, about a hundredth of a second down on his previous best. Well, in fact, he's done three laps. Well, let's take a look at He's still fastest at the top speed at the end of the main straight. Those times haven't improved. In fact, Christopher Haas is the one who's... Oh, no, Aurelian and Paddy's has moved in because uh, Fella was at the top last time, but 270 kph. But that's three laps within a tenth of a second for Ricardo Fella. Stayed in four, edging his way closer, but uh, consistency very, very strong. But don't forget, he's just uh, joined the team this weekend. Uh, for the Sprint Cup, taking the place of Norbert Seidler. And, uh, you know, doing his reputation, I'd say, a fair bit of good today. I mean, if you're showing pace as he's done, you know, being in the car, not as a regular driver, just stepping in, uh, that's impressive. Of course, there's also that sort of... Uh, well, Oscar Tunjo's car was at the top of the charts in yesterday's practice, but the target then was uh, 1, 46 point, 1 minute 46.2 seconds, and the, the Colombian at the moment way down the charts running the Silver Cup class for Toxport, just the one Toxport WRT car this weekend. The Gunmetal and Aquamarine livery number two. Still makes that magnificent Mercedes rumble, still one of the evocative sounds of motor racing to my ears, John. It's, it's quite visceral when you're trackside, you can feel oh, it you, in you your do. sternum. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a massive motor and it does a wonderful job as he goes into the pit lane, so this run has been truncated. And uh, so number two, Mercedes-Benz remains 16th quickest, 147.5 compared to a 146.2, so 1.3 seconds away from this time, the best time from yesterday's session. I and mean, frankly, throw a set of tires at it and you'll find the time. But he needs to find a bit more time than just a set of tires because the quickest time still rests with the 88 Mercedes and a 144.9 just under three tenths of a second ahead of Dries van Thor, who would have wrung everything out of the neck as we look at the young Belgian driver coming down to turn 10. He will wring every ounce of performance out of an idea. If anybody can do it, I've got to say, I've got to stop calling him young, but he's getting older by the day. He is, I think the, the hips, the knees starting to wake a bit, uh, but uh, really the thing about Dries now, he's, he's got the sweet time out of these tyres, and this lap's a little bit down, but I think again, he's also, in a race, you're not always out on new tyres, so you've got to be able to push them at, at the various points of their life, and that's what Dries is doing. Yeah, and, and it's back into the pit lane. Forget this. The whole scenario of Barcelona as a racetrack is it is hyper tyre sensitive. So the new tyre in ideal conditions, which they pretty much are right now for a quick lap, you get your one really good fast lap. Thereafter, you get a drop off, then you get a period of stability. But what you don't want to do is use that set of tyres unnecessarily and run around and run around and try and flog them you know get a time your one single hot lap on a brand new set of tires is never going to be matched once that tires completed that first flying lap yeah the teams know it the drivers sort of know it now we, we saw a short while ago hamza away we saw yusuf awager in the in the pits hamza awager the older brother is out in the car at the moment now he's seventh fastest but improving all the time so he could suddenly be in the mix but we saw the number, one of the silver, one of the Audis going off earlier. And the driver was Stephen Paulette. He's down in the pits. He's about to explain all. Stephen, what happened? Yeah, unfortunately, we had an ABS failure. I lost the ABS and I completely locked up the front. And you know, on this type of car, you are not prepared to lose the ABS. And uh, it's uh, on the worst turn of the track. I lock up the front and I go directly to the wall. Uh, it, it's always shame. It, it can be worse. We can repair for uh, Caliph. And the most important is to solve the, the problem. Is there a lot of work to do now to prepare the, repair the car? Is there a lot of prepared preparation? No, it's okay. It, honestly, it can be worse. Uh, it's a low speed corner and it's only body. It's not a structural problem. Mechanican uh, will do a, a good job like every time and it will be okay, but the most important is to find uh, what's happened with this ABS and it's lucky. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just looking at that instance again, John, we, we, we could see his turning the steering wheel, engaging second gear, but just going straight on. But there's the explanation. Also, I'm glad to hear it is only bodywork damage. Yeah. You're concerned they had to take it off and see if anything behind and structural had been twisted. Yeah, so the, the, the concerns were obviously the, the superficial work bodywork damage is not very great but it goes through the chassis and you've got important components directly behind you also you've got your water cooling your oil cooling all those pipes need to be checked that there hasn't been any compromises 
introduced. So it was a, an ABS failure. And just to sum up, because all these cars run ABS and you've got an adjustment in the car, you can either have it full ABS or almost totally dialed out. But if you're dependent upon it as drivers are, and then it for some reason goes AWOL, you're committed, you're, you're hitting the brake pedal with the same force that you would do when it's working. All of a sudden, the front wheels have locked up, and of course, you've got no steering. And that you saw him playing in the steering, but he, had, he because the front wheels were locked, he lost all steering control. Yeah, very tricky indeed. Just had sight of Lee Mole pressing on as he. It's good to have him back in the championship. Sort of five years uh, racing different things. We've just seen his ERC Sport Mercedes pushing on. Now, Riyad Chira at a meter. First season in Europe and has just taken it in his stride entirely. And what a pairing he's starting to make with uh, Kelvin van der Linde. Well, I think you've got two racers in this uh, 31 ID. So, most Japanese drivers who venture into Europe, they come. And they are they're, they're attacking race drivers. They're not sort of passive sitting back and letting it come to them. They're going out to take opportunities. And of course, Kelvin Van der Linde has been, I think, outstanding all year. And I remember back to Imola, certainly some of the best overtakes that we've seen so far all season, be it in sprint or endurance, came in that, in that Imola endurance round. I must say, talking of Japanese drivers, I was delighted yesterday when they announced the 56 car entry list for about 24 hours to see uh, can we Kobayashi coming over to have a, a crack and of course there's one factory Honda as well the Kobayashi will be uh, always entertaining and uh, I mean literally and metaphorically a character and personality as well as a you know a very exciting visually exciting racing driver to watch now, a driver who had been waiting to move up to GT3 for years, been racing in the Lamborghini Super Trofeo, Axel Jeffries, a rare thing in international motor racing. Uh, a Zimbabwean driver <laughs> seems to be forming a very tidy silver cup pairing with uh, with um, Ezekiel Perez yeah. Compact. They're down towards a tail at the moment, but uh, in fact, Axel's going to move them up the chart. They're 19th out of the 21 cars, but he's uh, sector times look as though they're an improvement on one timing screen not on another but he'll be picking up the pace but for axel you know this is a bit of bit of a dream and he's now really starting to go well for the the wonderfully liveried man panda motorsport entry they took victory at mizano do you remember in the silver cup class which was a on their debut as a, as a team as uh, so that was a, a, a big a big deal and for axel stays in 19th place there but uh, very close to the car's previous best so i expect next time around he'll pick it up so there is the 66 RD, it is currently, surprisingly, down in 11th position. I wouldn't have anticipated. Normally, Fred Bavish would have that car slightly further up. It's Nicholas Scholler behind the wheel right now. But I would have expected to see that car further up, certainly inside the top 10. I think what we're having is, is a point at which a lot of the start, starting drivers are now starting to cede to their teammates. But, um, John your favourites for this weekend. We were discussing it before we came on air. How racing team, Mario Engel, now on the track, needs to pick up the pace. He's down in 13th place. I don't think it's a reflection on the performance of the car or of the drivers. I think they're, they're no doubt going through a load of the work because the, these are two, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, three one-hour sprint races and they're, you know, different parts of the day. So that I would assume what they're doing is doing homework saving as much of their new rubber as possible for when they consider it's going to be important. And that will, first of all, be qualifying this afternoon for race one. Just quite interesting to see the pace. We've seen Fred Vavish out of the 66 attempt to Audi. Now it's Nicholas Scholl. But, you know, looking back over their season, it's, it's, Scholl's only 19 years old, so he's one of these early converts to GT cars. They've already picked up a fourth place this season. And so, you know, really interesting times as you see these new faces coming in year out. And if you don't pay too much attention to who they are, you then get caught up and find they're 18 and 19 years old. They've done a couple of seasons in something like Formula 4, for example, and they get into this, and some take to it like a duck to water. And I'd suggest that Fred Bovich is a very, very good teacher for Nicholas Scholl at the moment as he, as he gains experience. I, I mean, I would imagine that Fred Bovich could almost be his dad. I could scroll back and check. Let's see. Uh, possibly not quite, but maybe with a, with a run-up. But in fact, also just checking, it wasn't Formula 4, it was GT4. So Nicolas Scholl, not a single-seater convert. He started two years ago in GT4. Natural progression into this, but yes. it's still a big jump. Oh, what am I seeing in the background there? Shades of grey. Indeed, I'm not quite sure of the 50, which one that is. Somewhere in the spectrum, John. But yes, it certainly was a... 
a dark grey and black car coming down the start for the straight with um, dark grey clouds in the background. So we are, it's almost as if we're in October, John. Well, what that says to me is everybody in the pit lane should be looking, well, that's virtually due north, and realising that we need to do our homework as efficiently as possible because if the weather that I anticipate does come in and we've got a wet circuit, whatever it might be today, I mean, tomorrow it's also indicating there could be rain, but there will be certainly periods in the day when the track is dry, could coincide with one of these three events. You need to do your homework in a dry racetrack. Then if the track goes wet, do your homework for a wet racetrack. Now, of course, huge pressure to clinch the title for Charvi. It's sharing with Dries Van Tour all season. Wants to bag this title this weekend. Has three races to do it, but only this meager six and a half point advantage. But of course, Charles is also pitching to try and win the overall title as well this year. But in many ways, put that to one side. This is all about the Sprint Cup this weekend. It's about making sure they start on the front row. We know how busy the first few quarters at Barcelona can be. And so absolutely in everyone's mind as Charles suddenly slows. Yeah, it's backed out of it. Well, there's lap time, isn't it? I mean, the, the thing, difficulty at Barcelona is because fundamentally everybody's so closely matched in terms of, uh, of, of their qualifying lap time. So we're going to ride on board with the young Belgian as he comes through turn 16. Goes on to the straight, runs out to the very limit of the racetrack. But, you know, when you're 18 years of age, who cares? Does he care? No. So 250 kilometers an hour, going to get up to 265-ish, 70. That is up down into turn one, neat and tidy in. Transition back to the left and get on the throttle. Be careful not to overrun the exit. Here, long turn three in the balance of the car is that what the rubber, the grip you're going to get from your Pirelli tires. But open up the exit of the corner to get the best exit speed. Then big break, heavy break coming into turn four. Early entry and make your apex. Then the car gradually, gradually feeds its way out to the exit. There we see the curb. Then a short sprint down to turn five. A horrible little corner. It falls away. Fertz gets the nose of the Audi in, ideally. You can see the yaw of the car coming off. He ran the car right out to the edge of the track through six. Then this quick seven. This is a really tricky off camber seven. Then back over the sausage curve to the right. Up the hill into camps so turn nine. Come on, Charles. Nail the throttle here, my son. Get on with the program. A little bit cautious. A little bit. Let me just let me didn't sense the grip it was he needed that big big break an overtaking opportunity into turn 10 gets the nose in the body points in pretty well looking at Charles Burns's car this is the where we saw the 26 RD go off that uh, ABS problem and the sprint down to turn 13 again easy to be over aggressive and running too far to the left get the car back to the right brake swing it in left swing it back to the right Exit of 15, over the sausage curb again, and then back to exit of turn 16, and comes up completely at another lap. Currently in second place, let's see where this lap is. A 145.2 was his previous, or that car's previous best. This lap, a 1.6 seconds down, but on tyres that have done a number of laps. Yeah, the interesting thing, John, great lap to, to watch it through, was having turned through through turn five with that dropping exit, how he had to be really brave. The car was running wide, and the nose needed to start turning left for that downhill kink but uh, first and second first and third sectors on that lap were improvements now a car that really needs to find some improvement i'm sure they're confident is this one out racing team got a fantastic livery coming up for when that competes in the spa 24 hours in a couple of weeks time but right now the orange and black back on the track one minute 46.9 is their best lap one minute four that's two seconds I mean, it will take a little bit of change no concern for mario engel and lucas Stoltz. they've been racing as a pairing for years together and they can deliver but right now They've got to work through the programme. They also would have seen those big grey clouds and thinking, uh, will we be having rain for the second half of this session? Who knows? I suggest not. I think I think what we're looking at is a, a weather front coming in. I think it has yet to actually sort of land on the racetrack and then deposit whatever amount of moisture is in those clouds. So I've always had confidence in this driver pairing. And for me, it's one of the, the best balanced driver pairings in all the the GT uh, World Challenge Europe powered by AWS getting it all in so this combination is to me the sleeper over the three races to sweep the championship 
Right, turn nine, John. We know that's a critical corner. Campser, top of the hill, fastest speed. Oscar Tunjo, that car was fastest overall yesterday. Maybe this is where they found their advantage at the top of the hill, that crest, that wonderful one, where you were saying, get on the programme to Charles Get on yeah. that throttle. Well, 160 kilometres per hour through that, 100 miles an hour at the apex. And there's a corner, and you, you, it's, a, it's quite a steep incline up to turn nine. And you have to anticipate the apex. You turn before you see it. By the time you wait to see it, you're going to miss it. So 160 kilometers per hour. So down into turn one comes the number four Mercedes. Clear track. Now, Lamborghini, how are they going in terms of pace? Able Fry Racing, Mikkel Grenier has taken back over from Ricardo Feller. Ricardo put that in car number 14 into fourth place. It's now move back to 15th with Oscar Tunjo, just mention the driver's name, and he responds and goes fourth fastest to Top Sport WRC T. But Mikko Grenier and Ricardo Feller, the Swiss teammate, joining this weekend. Norbert Siedler not here in Barcelona. And these Lamborghinis, they took pole for both of the races at Zambort last time out, including one going off into the gravel, if you remember, at Sheblak and being brought back to the pits and then getting pole for the next race. They clearly got very good setup when they're on the black stuff. Yeah, and the, the, the Meme of Frey has really bonded with Lamborghini that now represents the brand in the sprint events. So down through turn five into turn six, then the brake and this off camber left, which throws the car way out to the right. And then you've got to struggle to get the car back. And you want to really avoid that sausage curve because it's there as a demarcation. You don't want to run over it. That puts impact and load into the suspension, a shock load into the suspension though down the hill into turn 10. This used to be a very bumpy approach into turn 10. They seem to have managed to smooth out. Used to see a lot of alternative line certainly approaches into it. Then this final sector where you're coming through the never ending 180 degrees in effect it is turn 12. Then the little quick flick into this final revised part of the racetrack 13 and over the curve. Well, not this type of Grenier. So is he staying out? He is going to stay out. His sector times, you can see, are considerably away from what I would call a qualifying run. So this is just another feature. Maybe they're just doing a, a five or an eight lap run to get a sense of where the car will be, try and find consistency over the, the longer periods than just simply an in and out lap. Yeah, what we're tending to see at the moment, John, is, is the fact you see the occasional improvement in terms of sector time, but not the whole way around the lap. The first sector is the one where the drivers seem to be finding a little more grip, getting out to play. Uh, this weekend, running in, uh, it's lost its gold livery. It's now into sort of silvery grey and white. Richard Mill, that's the SPS Automotive Performance Car. Valentin Pierberg and Dominic Bauman this weekend. We had Nick Foster last weekend uh, subbing and doing an outstanding job. Got them up to fifth overall, if you remember, John, in the yep. in the harem scary scare first half of the second race at Zambor, but uh, hunting down the Silver Cup honours, but at the moment uh, the car down in 18th place. Dominic Bauman back on board, the Austrian. Now, directly behind is Christopher Hauser in the 25 Santa Lock Audi. That's a car that is currently third quickest. Dominic Bauman is 18th quickest. Once Hauser gets into the, the, that sort of one second zone behind the Mercedes, he will stall out. In fact, he's probably not going to even bother because he will know I can't do anything. I, I'm not going to be able to overtake other than by an assist from Barman because they're in a different category. They're not involved in each other's challenges here this weekend. But it is a feature and it just emphasizes, in fact, I think Hess has just backed out of it. It just emphasizes the importance for all three categories here to get the best qualifying run that you can because wherever you start qualifying, well, probably more than any other racetrack in the calendar determine where you're going to finish. Yeah, it's very, very hard to pass. And with these three races, it's three occasions they have to get their qualifying laps right to get themselves at the sharp end of the grid. So I don't think it's probably escaped their attention. Dominic Bauman doesn't improve time, but he does set some improved sector times, that middle sector. Ironically, the sector that most drivers are not improving in at the moment, but we've got third of the cars, if not slightly more, in the pit lane at the moment. They've still got just over half an hour to go in this session. The grey cloud in the background, still grey, but not as bad, not as threatening as it was a short while ago. I think we'll get through this half hour without rain. Yeah, Christopher Hauser, yet again, he pulled, he let the Mercedes pull away, so he's now gone on through a flying lap. He's got clear air directly ahead of him, and that's what he would be looking for. He doesn't want to have to make any compromises in the lap. So, 
Christopher Hauser comes out just about 200 clicks per hour out of turn three. Then into turn four, not an awful lot you can do. It's an early apex, then you get on the throttle all the way and drive the car off. Then hard on the brakes down into turn five. And again, the track just falling away all the time. Car runs, keeps running, running, running wide. Then another break into turn six and seven. And through eight up the hill now, up into turn nine. It's a very short point to get the car settled after going through that six seven combination well and then immediately going to a blind corner if you go hop skip and a jump over the curbs you're right if you avoid that and keep the car more or less on what i'd call a black stuff then that is a much less of a problem so christopher haas third fastest at the moment let's just run down the times one minute 44.964 seconds banged in super early as early as it could have been by Raffaele Marcello, he's now back in that 88 Acura ASP Mercedes. Team of Bogoslavski had a good run in the middle section of this uh, pre-qualifying practice session, but he's sitting sitting pretty, nearly three tenths of a second up on the championship leading, number 32 Audi from Team WRT. Charles Viet's on board that at the moment. Christopher Hasser looking at him completing another lap. That was one of the best laps recently, but still the laps that the drivers are putting in now are about two seconds down of what Raffaele, there right at the start of the session. And uh, though they're gradually trying to close the gap a little bit, um, in many ways, maybe that lap from Marcello was actually just a little bit of a distraction. Well, it, 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 all it is is a single flying lap on a brand new set of rubber, clear track, perfect conditions. Go on, Raffaele knows how to nail it. He nailed it, he's done a time which is nobody can get within just under three tenths of a second of it. So now, with 30 minutes of the session remaining, this is when you, you're doing your homework, you're doing your, your prep, because having most people will have run either the freshest set of Pirelli tyres they had, or might have run, in the case of 88, I'm certain, a brand new set. Everybody knows the pressure that's on Barcelona. It is tyre dependent, and the second factor is, as the day progresses, the track changes its character, its personality, it's sensitive to temperature. We're not going to see that sort of summer type of temperatures, that big swing from early morning to early afternoon to mid afternoon to late afternoon. It's probably not going to get much above 18 maybe Celsius throughout today and will drop away from about three o'clock onwards. Just watching Andrea Bertolini really pushing on in his uh, A, of course, the Ferrari, fighting really hard, very close to the pace of Sky Tempesta racing. Eddie Cheever just two tenths of a second up on him, but I've just noticed Phil Keynes hopped on board the ERC Sport Mercedes, top in the Pro-Am class, uh, by, uh, only by a few whiskers from Dominic Bauman, but uh, good to see ERC Sport, their first year in the championship, they said they were building towards, I think their target was to get on the podium in class at Barcelona, they've exceeded that already, but uh, so Phil Keane does what he, he's done year well, in, year out. Phil Keane is a man for all seasons, Absolutely. a man for all racetracks, a man for all racing cars, be it an historic listed Jaguar or a GT3 Mercedes. Well, we came here wondering how 32 Audi could challenge. Let's hear from the man himself, Dries Van Tour. Dries, yesterday you were struggling a little bit with the setup. Have things improved a little bit today? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, first of all, it started all by Thursday, having a having some issues and having uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately crash. But uh, luckily, the team brought out another car, and we we we've managed to to continue our weekend. Uh, but yeah, so yesterday we've been struggling a little bit with the setup. Uh, I mean, today we found a bit more. But now there are some other issues coming. But I mean, I'm confident that we will that we will work through it and that we will be ready for qualifying. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that sends the eyebrows up. How to start your potential championship clinching race meeting, damaging a car, requiring another to be brought down from Belgium. That wasn't the work of a moment. That's uh... No, but I'll tell you what is impressive is that WRT, have, not only have they got a vehicle available, that they can just push the button, throw it in a transporter, drive all the way down across Europe, all the way down to Barcelona in the space of probably less than 24 hours, and you know, the car, okay, they had an issue or two yesterday. Well, I would have thought they were lucky to have only an issue or two. It could have been a much worse scenario for the championship leaders. And that's, that, again, is the pressure that is on WRT. They're already, in a sense, 
slightly knocked off their front foot onto their back foot with that you know, car being the initial car being not repairable and having to drag down a, a, a showroom of WRT Audis up in Belgium. Yeah, but, but in that scenario, you've got two young drivers. I mean, Dries, we keep talking about him being young. He's now 22. But he had just so many years of experience in these cars. At least he can stay calm and take each of the challenges as it comes. But it really is a mental struggle. A team that uh, had a problem this morning, clearly the CMR Blue Bentley, number 108, bottom of the time charts at the moment in 21st position. So I don't know why that was in the pit garage for as long as it was, but anyhow, back on the track now and uh, starting to pick up the pace. Pierre-Alexandre Jean taking over. Hugo Chevalier, his young... Well, he's also young, both teenagers. Um, teammates did the early running, but at the moment sitting down three seconds off the ultimate pace, but that's going to come down. As you can see, the first sector alone, Pierre-Alexandre has uh, taken a huge chunk out of that. So I can't tell you what the problem was for, for CMR with the blue Bentley, but... Uh, looking according to pace now as though whatever the problem was has been well and truly sorted well they're certainly on this lap they're seeing significant improvements by the time they came through second sector now this final and more technical sector so he needs to maintain and it's at this part of the lap where every lap the poor set of tires goes spare me spare me and all you can do is just drive through it so let's see, 21st quickest, slowest of the 21 cars. So this ought to see the Bentley move up into the top 20. It does into 17. There we have it. That'd be the first step. And they'll be able to pick off a few more, I am sure. But the only moves one place behind the HRT Mercedes, still biding its time, working through its program in 16th overall. That's the car second in the championship. But another factor, John, is the fact that these Lamborghinis from Emil Fry Racing are more and more in the mix. And this this could work both for and against the challenging 32 Audi of Dries Vantor and Charles Vietz. If he can get that between him and and the uh, HRT Mercedes on the grid, that would be a massive job done. I mean, the Lamborghinis want to be in the front of the grid. Well, They've shown they can do it. But remember, we've got three events. So your scenario could play out three times this weekend. Or not, not at all. Whatever. It's one of those factors that we're going to have a qualifying session later this afternoon for the first of the three races. It'll be a late afternoon race. Temperatures will be back down again. Whatever's coming from the sky, we don't know. And then we've got a, a race, a qualifying session tomorrow morning, two qualifying sessions tomorrow morning, and then a race in middle morning, and then a race at the back end of the afternoon. So it's, it's covering the entire spectrum of what you're going to get for your weather forecast and Timor Borgoslowski back behind the wheel according to timing and scoring it was Raffaele Marcello in out in out in so Borgoslowski going to get another run 24 minutes on the clock remaining and he's back in the pit lane so has he done what he has to do or has he decided he doesn't like what he's been given well, and he wants to change it Right, go to the end of the main straight, drive as hard as you can, and do remember to turn into turn one. So, 270 kilometers down. First, we had two cars on that, then three, now four, because Thomas Neubauer has got the Lexus into the mix as well. But, uh, do you know small what? margins. I, I, I do want to see four cars doing the same speed, because it means they can't overtake. I want to see big differences. Big, I want to see somebody doing 280 kilometers down the straight. The car might be a dog around the rest of the racetrack, but it'll, I tell you what, down the straight, it'll be mighty. Well, more chance these days, if you have a car that can't handle too well, if you've got that chicane, if it had been the original sweep around the top of the hill and then onto the main straight, you wouldn't have a hope. Right, Sky Tempesta Racing, they, they've had a hope everywhere they've been. Running in the prime class at the moment, though, they're down in third in class in terms of qualifying, well not qualifying, pre-qualifying pace, they'll expect to get a move on, but again other flies in the ointment Lee Moles taken over the ERC Sport Mercedes that top in the Pro-Am class from Phil Keen, Phil Keen put it up to 13th overall, that's impressive now let's just go through the Silver Cup class, Oscar Tunjo tops that in 4th overall, Mikhail Grenier second in class, sharing with Ricardo Feller this weekend, and third in the Silver Cup class it's now Yusuf Awega. They set a good time early on, but just wait for the Stephen Pellet car, the one that went off. That's been back out onto the track and back in again. That's at the bottom of the charts at the moment. So frustration for them. But we've seen that pairing of Simon Gachet, Stephen Pellet, just so good in race form. The bodywork and the damage we saw superficial. The thing the driver is going to be concerned about, and he will want this reassurance, 
from his engineers is, why did I have a, an ABS failure? And will it fail again? Is it a rogue problem? Or is it just unplug one box and plug another one in and you're good to go? Yeah, I mean, as Stephen Pallette pointed out, he said it was probably the, the lowest, lowest impact point on the circuit. He was in second gear and it was a bit of a gravel trap to take off a bit of a speed. But uh, yeah, yeah but Bruce, other places. Bruce, you know, having it at a, at a low speed part of the circuit is one thing, but the driver's brain goes clunk, click, clunk, click. What happens if it happens at the end of the main straight at 270 kilometers per hour? You know, it's one thing doing 60 kilometers per hour, 270 is a different deal altogether. So another lap completed by Ezekiel Perez. Compact stays in 19th place overall. That wasn't a quick lap. Again, a lot of the drivers now working through the system. Who's making the moves at the moment? In fact, look at the timing screen. Nobody is advancing. We might get some quick times right at the end of the session, but I think you're seeing, well, as we saw with that number 88, Aka ASP Mercedes, in and out of the pits, just made its seventh pit visit. I, They're working through a program, John. Well, I think sitting here, with my sort of thinking hat on. Why is the number four Mercedes, Lucas Stoltz, Maro Engel, only in 16th position? I could say a number of things, but with 20 minutes remaining, I suspect, I suspect we might find the number four Mercedes at the sharp end of this 21 car grid before and, the chequered flag comes out. And as you say, that just bangs in its fastest second and third sections of the lap, still down in 16th place keeps on sliding back a little bit but I think maybe next time around we'll see it into the top 10 now the 163 Lamborghini that's the second of the Lamborghinis in terms of uh, lap times at the moment in 6th place behind the sister car Miko Grenier in the sister car well, that's 5th gap between them 0.149 of a second and right now for the 163 being pedalled by Giacomo Alte he's got traffic right in front of him so that's not too handy at all he's got the Lexus the Lexus is uh not reverted to the top end of the pace. It's ninth now ninth, ninth, overall ninth, ninth overall for overall. Thomas Neubauer. It's like the OK times around, but not lighting up the screens at the moment. But for Giacomo Alto, Italian teenager, denied a really good run in the first race at Zambor when he stood out for, do you remember, John? One lap too long, and he had a right rear tyre explode on the start, finish straight, the uh, result of, sorry, left rear tyre, uh, of just going on too long on a, on where the tires yeah. on the track that was drying all the time. I think it was maybe compounded by other car setup issues. And in fact, we're running on a bank race track. The last turn at Zandvoort is a bank corner. And uh, if you're running, let's say, a little bit too much camber in the rear on a bank corner, you put a lot of load onto the inside shoulder of the tire. And I would imagine that might have been a contribution, maybe not the, the total reason, but certainly a contribution as to why that tire was so extreme. I mean, strikingly shocking uh, watching it happen but i must say that the, the improvements at zambor hugenholz box i thought was absolutely fabulous with the new great. bank that work corner the other one the one on the start finish straight it was great that we'd be the first international series to try it but it didn't need to the overtaking maneuvers that we may have and expected I, I, i've given it a lot of thought as some of our mutual friends and other commentaries do that the corner prior to the larry lyons act that's where the banking should actually be beginning. So you go into it, and then you should have a bank, two bank corners onto the main. Then I think you might get side by side because coming through that final, that penultimate corner, didn't give you a chance to get close to the car that you might want to challenge. And therefore it was very difficult to use the banking to any benefits. Did look spectacular before the start of the race when there were two by two around the banking there waiting to be released. But uh, I, I think I'm probably with you on maybe bank the penultimate turn at Zambor. Right now, here we are at Barcelona. They haven't changed the circuit for a considerable amount of time, and all the drivers know that come the race, they'll be taking is very difficult deep, cutting a corner a little bit there for Valentin Pierberg, kicking up the dirt. He's second in the prime class at the moment. Still, the ERC Sport Mercedes, the top of that particular tree. I don't know quite why Pierberg needed to do that, and there's no benefit in cutting a corner that acutely. Um, but anyway, it kicked up a lot of dirt on the inside of the corner. And he continues on his happy way in 14th place. So we've seen the two Bentleys and the blue one really started to fly. Let's hear from one of its drivers this weekend, Pierre-Alexandre Jean. 
PA, you've just got out of the car and you looked very animated, like you're struggling with setup in some way. Yeah, the, the team is pushing hard to try and give me the, the best car possible. We are working, we are trying something. So maybe this time on new tyre, we pushed a, a bit too far. But you know, in free practice, we are here for this, to push, try something. So yeah, I think the car will be good in, uh, in quality. What is it exactly that you're struggling with? So, yeah, what is it that you're struggling with? Yeah, for the moment we're a bit slugging with the rear, but uh, I think it will be will be set for the for the for the quality. We don't know if the it will be a rainy session. We don't know, but the car is fast on any session, so I don't worry about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So again, the perpetual struggle at Barcelona to get the sweet spot on your tyres, and uh, there was quite a lot of uh, questioning there. Was it? We don't know. Well, I think I mean trying to drag it out of a driver. What the problem is to the world is not actually that what you're paid to do as a driver. You just sort of be very vague. But if you've got a car that the rear end is unstable, either under braking or an entry to a corner, it, it's the thing that every race driver hates is not knowing if the back's gonna snap and bite you. So consequently, you're slower on the throttle, slower on the steering wheel. Uh, you have to settle the car, get the car, whether you do it by aerodynamics, or and another way of doing it is take some of the rake out of a car, which is another form of aerodynamic tuning. So put the center of pressure in effect slightly more to the tail of the car, which then has a makes the front end a little bit more inclined to wash out. It's a balance, and that's what that's why drivers talk about a car's balance. Well, let's see how Hugo Chevalier is balanced around this lap. He just got through some traffic, John. Take us around this lap. He'll hit nearly 270 kph before he starts breaking down for turn one. Take us from here. Okay, into turn one, you, you make a, a fairly gentle turn in because you want to maximize here, turn two, the exit, and then get yourself positioned to come into turn three, a long, long corner where you're building up speed all the way through. Car runs very, very wide, mid corner. Look how wide he's coming out of the exit of turn three. Almost, almost four wheels off the racetrack. Early entry into turn four. Again, you release the car from this point forward to maximize your exit speed, get the car straight, get to the right-hand side of the racetrack, then this off-camber downhill, turn five. I don't know any racing driver can say he's really ever felt he's grabbed turn five and got the best out of it. Then into turn seven and eight, again, watch the curbing on the outside, that sausage curb you can see there. But GT3 cars, they ride it, they've got suspension, which is not quite as stiff. Up to turn nine, most exciting corner on the racetrack, Big, big commitment. If you've got the grip, it's wonderful. If you haven't got the grip, you think, oh, I don't want to do this again. Hard on the brakes, down into turn 10. You've got to be precise, neat and tidy, not overdrive. If you start overdriving here, it'll all go away. And particularly at Barcelona, this part of the racetrack, you can have purple in the first sector, purple in the second sector, and it'll go just that sort of nondescript beige, which is the worst your colour you could get on your timing and scoring. Turn 16, line it up, let the car run free on the exit, and all you can do now is just push the throttle pedal through the firewall and try and go a little bit quicker. 17th, and a, what was the lap time? We didn't see a lap time, in fact. One minute, 48, so okay. a one and a bit seconds down. He did actually improve in that third and final sector, but Hugo Chevalier, a little bit blocked by traffic just before that lap, but... Uh, it's interesting here, they put tire, put new tyres on the car. That, that I thought, was an interesting point from pierre Alexandre Jean. Because... It's an interesting point, and they didn't appear to benefit. Oh, well, why are the wipers... Have the, uh, don't, don't tell me it's ra not raining already. It wasn't meant to rain until we got to, well, at least midday. So, Charles Viet sweeping around in second place. Still that time set. Uh, almost feels like it was before the start of the session, so long ago by... Raffaele Marcello to top the charts. Yaka ASP 88 Mercedes in the pit lane at the moment, but sitting on that advantage of 0 0.282 of a second over this one. The Charles Vitz Van Tor 32 Audi bouncing over the curbing there. We can't see from the commentary position whether it is raining or not, but either Charles Virch has inadvertently flicked on the wiper and hasn't noticed it, or there is a. But there's nothing that is obvious. Normally you get from certain camera angles you can see when rain has begun. There's not an awful lot of that windscreen. Charles, you're wasting energy. Turn the wipers off. It's not listening to you. Now we know. 
And it's not, you could say, is that a movable aerodynamic device on his windscreen? Well, you can put it out there, John. We'll see what happens. But uh, let's see. So, again, so first gear to that scratchy chicane and then even less acceleration because diving into the pit lane. So what have we got left? A dozen minutes in this one hour and 20 minute session. Interrupted briefly when Stephen Pallette went off earlier with that very strange failure. ABS failure up into turn 11, turn 12 into the gravel. Car was uh, quickly withdrawn, but hasn't been back out onto the circuit. Still fixing the bodywork. The car that's top in Pro-Am at the moment, ERC Sport, new to the championship this year with the Mercedes. Lee Mole are rumbling around the circuit at the moment. The car's just faster than the other Mercedes in the class. The SPS Automotive Performance version. Time set by Phil Keane, but Lee Mole doing the driving at the moment. So, again, just reuniting himself with this circuit that uh, I think the last time he was probably here in, in full anger was probably in the BMW Z4 he used to race all those years ago, back in 2015. Well, that's going back a long time, Z4s. But making his way down 250 kilometers per hour, 250. Well, he's on the brakes fairly early into turn one. You know, the, the, the quick and the brave will be late in the brakes, and that's sometimes why you see certain high speeds in a, 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 coming into a braking zone. It doesn't mean they got through the corner cleanly, it just means they were very quick at the point they got on the brakes. Yes, it's maybe small recompense if you don't manage to negotiate the corner. I was quick on the way in as your, your token offering back to the team, Chief. I mean, it's, that's very useful information for a team. They yes. really appreciate Bring it that. back. Yeah. So, 1 minute 44.964 seconds was the fastest time, is the fastest time, hasn't been challenged since the start. We had Dries Van Tour close in to just under, just over a quarter of a second from the ultimate pace. He stays in second place. Arta Rougier and Christopher Hasser, they share the Audi that's sitting third on the charts for Santa Lot Racing. Top Silver Cup runner, Top Sport WRT, Oscar Tonjo, Yuso Bohaka, Colombian and Finnish duo, fourth fastest overall. Just ahead of Mikkel Grenier, who's sharing this weekend with one of his regular co-drivers from the Endurance Championship, which is Ricardo Feller. Norbert Siedler not here. Bring over the young Swiss driver. So Feller's done a good job, but he does know the card. But the Lamborghini is sitting fifth and sixth overall. So Emil Frey getting used. He's run all sorts of cars, hasn't he, over the years? We had the Jaguars for so long, and um, you know it's, they've really, really taken these Lamborghinis, John. Yeah, I mean they spent years developing the Jaguar and ended up having a, a very effective race car. And then that program came to an end, and they jumped on the Lexus program again. Spent a year or two years developing it and had success. Oh, almost getting caught out, Grenier. Almost getting caught out with the 25 Audi on a slow out lap. Well, yeah, that, that's yeah, that's the Stephen Pallette car. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I just said it hadn't come out of the pits, so and now it has. Car number 26. Sister car is the the yellow and white one, which is the one that's ranking third overall for Santa Lot Racing. After Rougier, Christopher Hasser. But let's see what uh, how those repairs have been effective. And, uh, obviously, with only 10 minutes for it to go out around the track, it's not really about setting a time. It's just checking the repairs have been done and everything is straight it's and true. Just put, take the car out ensure that the driver in this case Stephen Pallette is content and happy that the repairs have been affected and the car is as it ought to be so they're not going to probably make any significant gains in terms of where they are they're 21st they ought to by the natural pace of both drivers and that particular car they should comfortably in the, be in the top 10 whether they will actually make any effort to do so um, as long as the car feels good I imagine they'll just stick with whatever the rubber they have on the car and um, and save tyres for later in the day. One of the anomalies when you have a, a long stop in the pits, the first sector time for Stephen Pallette was listed as not 1 minute 30, but 53 minutes because of all the time spent <laughs> what... in the pit garage. Mikko Grenier aborts that lap, so it looks like they're starting to wind down towards the end of the session, but that car, second in the Silver Cup class, fifth overall, knows he's very, very much in the mix. And the Awaka brothers... Audi with that orange stripe up the nose comes out onto the circuit as Stephen Paulette completes a flying lap. But uh, one of the cars that's really going well this weekend for Emil Fry. Let's go down and hear from the driver of 163, Albert Costa. Albert, you were on fine form last time out in Zandvoort. How's the car feeling here? Yeah, um, as I said before, the car is not bad. Um, I think. We need to do some extra work until quali. 
I don't know what's going to happen. They say come to Spain, it's gonna be sunny, but actually the rain is coming, so I don't know what's going to happen. But yeah, racing at home and do not, I'm gonna do my best. Absolutely, it's an important race for you. You know, if it rains, do you have any preference, dry or wet? Oh, I really don't care. Um, in the past, I've been driving here in other, in other series uh, in the wet and dry. I know the track a bit, so it's a, it's a good point on, on my side, so I really don't care. Um, if the cat is good, then everything is fine. Thank you. Have a great weekend, Elman. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that sums it up from Albert Costa. If the car is good, everything is fine, John. Well, I mean, Albert Costa is one of those drivers who's quite capable of putting that, that Lamborghini either on pole position, certainly in the front row of the grid, or in the front two or three rows of the grid. But I keep thinking back to Nürburgring. I keep thinking back to Zandvoort. He is a little demon when the lights go out. He is absolutely committed and honoured and does not take a prisoner, let alone take ten prisoners. And, I mean, he's just irrepressible. And I would like to know, he knows the circuit very well. What are the secrets of being quick here, Albert? Tell us the secrets. Well, he wasn't going to do that, really. I think he nearly did. Nearly, but just pulled it back. So, with a little uh, revised front body work there, you can see the front left-hand corner, not in uh, full, fully liveried uh, get-up there for Stephen Pellet, but he's done his outlap. He's done a sort of semi-flying lap and brought it back into the pits. It's out, it's in. Check it over, back into the garage. Yeah, and go back and have a quick spanner check as the Mad Panda Mercedes. Their session is effectively over, only just five and a bit minutes remaining. So, as you pointed out, Bruce, most teams have done their homework. As we look at the 163, continuing around. Giacomo Altoe. So, up the hill. And through turn nine, watch the exit. Yeah, it goes out to the limits. Got a rubber. You can see just kits, clips up with the left front wheel, then the braking down into turn 10. Turn 10 has been revised. Another part of the racetrack that was revised. Previously, it went a little bit deeper and was a little bit, um, to me, a preferable corner. But in the interest of the building up of speeds of other categories that are racing here, MotoGP, Formula One, whatever, they brought the entry into turn 10 and slightly more towards the exit of turn nine. So here we go. Altome comes through, turn 16. Builds up the speed, 200 clicks per hour. 25, 30. Oh, and he's going to be hitting 260 before he gets in the brakes, minimally. 265. Well, that's 5K down on the, the pace set by... Uh four other runners, two in Audis, one in a Lamborghini and the Lexus as well. But Mikhail Grenier, top of the charts for Lamborghini. Obviously, all of 270, but his must be the best 270. You can see having to take a short shift, third to fourth, coming through the exit of turn three, then back down to second gear. Then again, a shorter shift, I suspect, into third gear. You don't want to break traction, because once you break traction, then your forward motion is going to be lost down to second gear again late on the throttle so i would think this car is running probably the best of the rest of its rubber and just again waiting waiting all the time to feel the bite that you need to then give you the confidence just freeze the throttle coming through turn nine that's not bad when I mean, putting the speed on that that was a good mid speed corner for the lamborghini then down the hill 230 clicks just under that down to second, oh, first, first gear, and a quick shift to second gear. Personally, if I was driving, I was staying in second because I would not want to have to make a change just on that critical exit point of turn 10. And then back into second gear for this final complex and a short run down to third, 14. Back down to first again. What are these guys doing? I know they're paid for six gears. You don't have to use them all the time. <laughs> Again, interesting to see that Oscar Tungjo is still the fastest driver through the top of the hill at uh, the apex of Kamsa at the top there. Such a great, great corner, and it's great having these facilities. Let's see the, the speed. Let's go down in 265 again. Let's hear from Mad Panda Motorsport making a splash this year. Let's catch up with Ezekiel Perez Compact. Ezekiel, this is your local circuit. We're predicting rain later on. What is this track like in the wet? It's going to be really tough, to be honest, because there's a lot of rubber at the moment. 
so it's going to be really, really slippery, but it's going to make it a, a really interesting challenge for sure. And of course, with three races ahead, you've got to be careful. Yeah, yeah, especially on the first one, because today there's a lot of rain coming. So and if you want to have the car safe for tomorrow, yeah, we need to take care. But again, uh, this is the last sprint race, so we need to make sure we get uh, good points. Now, I've got some curiosity that needs to be settled for our commentators. Can you please tell us why the team are called Mad Panda? That, that's a good question. Uh, maybe we win the overall championship, like endurance and sprint. Maybe, maybe I'll tell you. We'll keep investigating throughout the course. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, a riddle, a quiz. I like that. Ezekiel's such a character, isn't he? He is. He's one of those people that, uh, you know, you, he, he's just, you can't help but like him. And, uh, I mean, whoever came up with the concept of a team called Mad Panda, certainly in my view, brilliant. Uh, and I'm sure there's a very straightforward and uncomplicated, but everybody wants to know why was the team christened Mad Panda. Yeah. It's sort of very much the, the way a lot of Japanese teams pick a name, like Good Smile Racing and, and so on and so forth. But it's a riddle to us, and we still haven't got to the foot of it. Maybe, just but maybe, we'll find Bruce, out on Sunday. The trouble is, what it means, whatever the name is Japanese, is something very logical. It's just that, that maybe the literal translation into English seems a bit strange to us. Perhaps. So Stephen Paulette still pounding around, still bottom of the charts. He had that 53-minute time in the pits, came out, did an outlap came in but again he's just running it down the clock is just a, under a minute to go one hour and 20 minutes of practice the last practice ahead of qualifying almost at an end and if you want to know when qualifying is the cars go out at 12.50 local time and actually we've suddenly got a, a driver who's about to improve their lap time by looks things after a really long pit stop Tommaso Mosca that 55 Audi do you remember it got pushed into pit exit it stopped on the start finish stroke with uh, Mattia Drudy on board again that's just a way of investigating uh, you know is the car fine before we go into qualifying later on so T teams have had a struggle one this number 26 Audi from uh, Santa Lot Racing. Clearly that seems to be working okay. Here's the corner, turn 11, turn 12 is where it went straight on. Got around it this time, so that has clearly been fixed. But uh, it's just being sure all is fine ahead of qualifying. I mean, it's a case of slowly, slowly, just go through the motions. There's nothing to be gained. There's now the flag is out, check flag we can see there. So this session is over. In fact, Stephen Van has decided just bring the car in now there's no benefit to be gained from a second another final lap we need to know we find out what we needed to know as the 55 continues around so Tommaso Mosca he got greens on that last sector all three sectors in fact didn't improve his overall time the best time this car has done so far this morning is a 146.417 Pressing on on this one. Well, I don't know whether he's taken the checkered flag or he got across. No, he was, ahead, he was ahead of the checkered flag. Okay, so back, he's. This is a pucker first improvement in the first sector, but look, he's no, eight no, tenths he's, of no. a second down on the ultimate pace, and now he's. Bring it in. Bring it, bring it in. There's no benefit to staying out. But he's not so, taking. He's not taking any prisoners. Runs a bit, a little bit wide, going into the first part of turn 12. So maybe he is going to compete the lap and just get a. But you can see on. Um, the second sector and 2.3 seconds down so why he would want to continue i don't know but well he's going to do so he's going to finish the lap so maybe the team feel that last changes that they made to the car they want that information 10th position so he takes the checkered flag the last car on the lap and those keep referring to the weather we anticipated that weather earlier in the session confirmed by Ezekiel Perez compact we're going to get maybe not biblical levels of rain but quite a lot of it well right at the start of that session the 88 Mercedes went out on the track Raffaele and Marcello did a lap it was fastest Raffaele fastest there in that session you've got to be happy with that yeah I mean it's it's only through practice it's nothing nothing important but the car felt good I think the lap was was not pretty bad so I mean it's it's a good start of the weekend, but we'll see when it counts. And of course, the conditions could well change for the next session. Yeah, I mean, I'm not doing Q1, so it's more about, uh, it's more for like teamwork problems. Tomorrow looks like dry, so for Q2, Q3 should be okay, but probably it's the same for everyone, so we have to adapt. Have a great weekend, thank, thank you. you. Every element counts. Look, you streamlined Raffaele Marcello, the hair is gone. 
just so, doing everything I mean, to get I, that fast time. I, I don't want to say it, but it sort of begins with slap and finishes with something else. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an aerodynamic haircut. But so, it's, it's typically laconic Raffaele Marcello asked about qualifying. Hey, it is, it's not me driving, it's a, a Timo's problem. Tomorrow it's dry, so I'm okay. But we know when he gets in the car, that flick, that switch is flicked. So WRT very much in the mix. The number 32 car, second on the track this morning. And uh, again, Patrice Van Tor, the Charles leading the championship. Absolutely critical. They keep staying at the top of any time chart. So that time by Raffaele Marcello, 1 minute 44.964 seconds. The car then just pounded round the track with his team at Timo Bogoslajski. Raffaele went out again. Dries van Tour, Charles Vietz, really well balanced pairing in second fastest place. And uh, Arthur Rougier, Christopher Haas have been threatening a top result all year. This is pre qualifying, but third fastest shows they're right in the mix. And top of the Silver Cup class, Yusuf Pohaka, Oscar Tundra, they were fastest of all in yesterday's practice session. So they're coming good right at the end of the season. Ricardo Feller on board this weekend with Mikkel Grenier, showing the Lamborghinis are in the mix. They're fifth and sixth fastest. The best of the Bentleys, the better of the Bentleys. Jules Gugnon and Nelson Panciatici, they're right in the mix as well. Hamza Avega and Joseph Avega, the two brothers, uh, also running right near the sharp end. 21 cars went out to play Stephen Paulette and Simon Gachet at the bottom of the charts, but there's reason for that. Their car slid off into the gravel. They missed most of the session, but for all the crews looking ahead to qualifying, we know the track was dry now. It was cool now, but rain is on the way, we're told. But this morning's session was all about sorting the cars for what may lie ahead and tyre wear here, so critical. And unfortunately, ABS failure there put Stephen Paulette through the gravel into the Tech Pro barrier. That was up at turn 12, Bank the Sabadell. Session was uh, stopped briefly, and uh, then drivers had to run out to get into the second part of the session. Then Matai Drudy pulled off on the start finish straight. The car was recovered, that only just got back out in the final moments of the session. I got a little busy in parts, but one car definitely keeping its powder dry. The HRT, the Hout Racing Team Mercedes, comes here second in the championship, only 16 at the end of that session. Such a technical circuit. Big overtaking the start, finish straight, the Tech One. Lexus blasting past the Mad Panda Mercedes there. And still that time from the 88. Aka ASP Mercedes at the top of the charts. The two, two Bentleys always trying to move up the order. There's Hugo Chevalier flashing the lights in the blue CMR Bentley. Number 32, Audi went into second place with the championship leaders. Little drop of rain, and that could be a big factor later on. But it was the 88 Mercedes, Raffaele Marcello, who was the class act this morning.